Come on. They're right there. Let's go. Move, 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 move. This episode of Choices Not Chances podcast is sponsored by Louisiana Gun Shop. Located on Highway 90 West in Broussard, Louisiana, just south of Lafayette. For more information, stay tuned at the end of this episode. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast episode by the guest are those of the guest and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of the hosts or partners. This is Choices Not Chances podcast with Ryan and Matt. I'm your co-host, Matthew Charette. Sitting next to me is Ryan Rogers. Ryan. Hey, everybody. What's going on? We're going to bring you a good one today. Uh, before I introduce our guest, I just want to stay at the beginning of the podcast. If you see something that resonates with you, uh, something that you can take away from this podcast or that you think is going to bring light to somebody else's life, please don't be selfish with the information. Share it out, blast it out, put it on your platform. Um, today, I'm, I'm kind of reaching out to my North Carolina, uh, Onslow County, um, specific uh, Marines that have children in the public schools, parents, families, friends, civilians, doesn't matter who you are. you got parents uh, that are... Uh, have their kids in these public schools and we're going to do a little bit of a talk today with um with bradley williams who's in a retired infantry marine running for onzo county school board um after seeing some of the strings of violent events that have happened in our county schools this is something that you know struck deep with me because i have school-aged kids in these schools and you know we just had a, a violent attack that ended with you know one student passing and others injured at uh, at one of the high schools here. And so it's something that struck dear to me. It's like, we really need to get a handle on um, the people that are on the school board, how this process works, how we can air grievances, and how we can make this a better learning environment, a more conducive learning environment that's safe for our children. Um, and so I want to have him on. I saw a social media post uh, that you had on your page uh, recently that was basically just kind of laying out your uh, non agenda to politics, but your reasoning for wanting to get involved in. And so it struck me, it resonated with me. It was something that I was um, wanting to know more about. I reached out and contacted uh, Mr. Williams, and he's been gracious enough to give us some time. And so I appreciate you coming out. And uh, we talked a bit offline, but now we're uh, now we're hot and we'll we'll kind of get into it. So um, usually at the beginning of every show, I want to understand the person and i have a couple of you know traditional questions that i ask each guest sure um mainly for selfish reasons but uh so we just kick it off um where do you come from uh, family siblings uh where'd you grow up what kind of lifestyle and culture in your family was religion involved and then we'll kind of go from there sure so i'll just give you a bit of background um i was born uh about 30 miles to east of Charlotte, Stanley County, Oakburg, North Carolina. Uh, went to a high school called West Stanley High School. Uh, rural area. Um, not a lot of major towns around there and stuff. Uh, I have one younger sister. She's about six years younger than me. Uh, grew up in a you know, traditional household. Mom, dad, younger sibling. You know, two kids. They both work. Uh, we went to school. Uh, and then um, when I was 17, almost 18, uh, decided to join the Marine Corps. I was dating my high school sweetheart. We've still been married for 22 years now. Um, but joined the Marine Corps, uh, ended up Paris Island, uh, down here at School of Infantry at Geiger. And then my first duty station was at Pendleton. About six months after I got out there, I flew home, married my wife, flew back, and then went to the field and <laughs> left her in an empty apartment. <laughs> I know that. But, uh, you know, I, I grew up in church. Uh, it was a Methodist church. Uh, we attended regularly. Uh, I met my wife. Her dad's a uh, Baptist pastor, so I switched churches to spend time with my wife on Sundays. I know that may sound bad, but I was also 16. Uh, joined the Marine Corps, and I didn't spend a lot of time uh, in church. I spent a lot of time in the Middle East, mm -hmm. um, deployed. At Pendleton, I think it was three deployments in about four years. Back-to-back um, -back deployments. We got back from you and went and invaded Iraq. Um, all my deployments were interesting. <laughs> Uh, came back from Iraq from the invasion, moved uh, back to here, uh, stationed at SOI. I was a combat instructor there for a few years. Went to 2 2 for a few years. Um, while I was at SOI, we had our first kid, uh, Kaylee. She's 
just graduated from Dixon High School and now she's at Methodist University. Um, went to 2 2, a couple deployments. Went to um, INI Station in Tennessee. Was there for a few years and then uh, came back down here. Uh, did a deployment or two. Retired out of SOTG back in 2019. Mm hmm. 2017, I felt called into ministry, so I went through that process with my local church, um, received my ordination, and then they offered me an associate pastor position, which is part-time. So I continued to do that. I worked for a friend of mine running heavy equipment. Um, my youngest daughter was born in 2012, right after we moved back down here. But Onslo was really the first place in those 20 years that we felt like calling home, mm. uh, surrounded by good friends and family at church. And uh, so we decided to stay down here. Check. Now, I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure. What uh, what year did you come into the Marine Corps or enlist? 99. 99. And what was, so your, your pre-9-11, what was your catalyst to service? I don't know. I had this uh, image in my head of a Marine Corps infantryman. And to be honest with you, when I joined the Marine Corps, I thought everyone was infantry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i tell you a funny story. I was in uh, Iraq when we invaded and... Uh, when we were coming out, when our battalion was pouring out, we went to a place called Camp Diwania. I know some mm -hmm. of the Marines are probably familiar with it, especially mm -hmm. from that time. And uh, I met the first guy that I, I can remember that I know of that was a water purification specialist. <laughs> I'd been putting tablets in my canteen and stuff, and I met this guy. And I was like, what do you do? He's like, I'm a water purification specialist. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, by then I knew we had other MOS's, yeah. other jobs, but I didn't know we purified our own water, and I'd been in for four years. <laughs> but uh, I thought I had this picture in my head of, I think I had this uh, poster or something, or seen this poster, uh, Marine and Cami's ridiculous poster now, but uh, had a K bar in his mouth and a rifle slung o over his little arm, you know, low crawling through the mud and stuff, and I thought I want to do that. Yep. Yeah. It's know. funny because. Um, Growing up for me, when I pictured Marines, they were big, muscular, like in the in image in my head. They were big, muscular, just beasts with tattoos all over their arms. And then I came in. And yeah, and I'm like, 104 pounds. Yeah, yeah. You know, then I came in. And on, we, on double rats. Yeah, yeah. We come in and it's not that, especially if you're a grunt because you don't have the regimented eating. Nah. You don't have regimented workouting, uh, working out. And so it's, I mean, I, I play sports, so I had semi-athletic, but I had no desire to run endless miles per day. Yeah, you know, yeah. my idea was being outdoors was you know hunting or something like that. Yep, yep. But uh, I don't know. I was a huge fan. I guess fans probably a bad a bad word, but a huge interest in Vietnam. I had mm. uh, a lot of people I was surrounded with growing up had come out of Vietnam, and uh, just a huge interest in that. I had a high school teacher when I was at West Stanley High School. He taught this unconventional class, but it was called History of War. Mm -hmm. So the whole semester, the whole class, you were, you were learning about three different mm -hmm. wars as you went along. One of our assignments was to interview someone that came out of one of those wars. Uh, my dad had a good friend that had came out of Vietnam. And uh, it was just an eye-opening experience. I appreciated, you know, that selfless sort of service that went into who made this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I joined the Marine Corps for those reasons. Yes, sir. It's interesting. I have a kind of a romantic uh, fascination with uh, both Vietnam and World War II. Don't know why. Don't know where it comes from necessarily. Right. Um, but we interviewed a local legend uh, out of uh, um, Swansboro. Swansboro, mm -hmm. Mr. Dave Brown, retired lieutenant colonel out of the Marines, and he was the company commander of Fox 24 just after they cleared way. Fox 25. Fox 25 just after they cleared way city uh -huh. for like the next year. I mean, he sat in that chair right there for four and a half hours getting through his book that he wrote on Vietnam called Battle Lines. Mm -hmm. covers five years, like th three and a half years before he checks into like his whole coming out of that. And we covered a lot of that. And I'll be honest with you, like I've said this before on the show, but as a Marine, you go through boot camp and you hear about these wars and you hear like way city, house to house, and, and, and you hear these terms. But until that man sat in that chair and it, and described Way City, until I read that book and realized like the gravity of that fight and what really was was what really was going on um, outside of the wave top historic comments that you hear compared to our war, I just un, unconscionable to me and like the loss unconscionable to me. 
Yeah. Uh, um, crazy. Yeah, you know, sort of surreal. You know, first time you're in combat, it it's definitely has its. I don't know how to describe it. There's just something indescribable about it. But then you you go back, and then you're leading Marines. You know. I don't. I don't know how to describe it. You two know what I'm talking about. But, no, for and, sure. and those that've been there, they they know what I'm talking about. It was just indescribable. But you know, like what you're saying, just seeing the history of, of patriots that went before us, and and trying to imagine what they endured. You know, and despite having some of the same experiences, you can't never you know feel it, fully understand what that previous generation went through. And you know what's interesting is I've talked to him. I've talked to Vietnam. I've talked to one World War II guy. I've talked to a Korea guy when I was uh, an infantry squad leader's course. He was our guest speaker at like our graduation. Mm-hmm. He came and spoke to us. And this dude was like frozen chosen kind of uh, element that he was in and like unconscionable to us, right? Like, but he says the same thing about our war. Yeah. The technology, the weapons, the indirect fire, the suicide attacks. Vietnam seen that because yeah, like especially in the Arizona territory that um, Mr. Dave Brown talked about, they would booby trap everything from used canteens to body parts oh, yeah. to everything. Yeah. So they got a little bit of that, you know, that IED, that booby trap type, um, or more of it, let's say. Um, oh, it's like, but but a lot of those other generations, they they feel the same about our wars. Like well, we can every deployment for for me was wildly different. Uh, yeah. You know, first time we invaded Iraq. You know, I suppose there was a few IEDs towards the end of our tour there. Um, but I go back a year, year and a half, I, I don't remember. And now IEDs are everywhere, you know. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ju- just because you had that previous experience of war fighting, you go back and now it's a whole new new battlefield. Yeah, And in yeah. some cases, a whole new enemy. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and you know, SF and the Army does interesting things. Like I had, um, we had uh, Johnny Glenn on and... He had deployed 10 or 11 times to Afghanistan. Now, are they shorter chunk deployments? Right. Yes, they are. But these guys made assets and went right back to these same towns or were able to watch it evolve where 3 2 is going to come this time, then 1 6 is going to be behind them, and then somebody out of Horno is going to be behind them. And it's never going to be a constant rotation. So every time you do go back, it's different. Yeah, and, and that's the one thing that I like about their structure is that they can build those assets and they're coming right back oh, to yeah. those regions, to those towns, to those people. And they can tell the people, Hey, I'm, I'm back in six months. If this next team is, you know, if it's not savory, I'm back in six months. Hold on. Don't go crazy. You know what I mean? It's only six months. And then boom, they're back in six months. Hey, you know, Abdullah, <laughs> how are things going? You know, or whatever. And then they have that camaraderie and that know-how where the new stick of new Marines that comes in are going to, are going to be harsh right out the gate no matter what because they got to test their baseline. Mm. They got to build as- atmospherics, right? So they're going to be stern when maybe they didn't need to be stern to Abdullah. They just didn't know him. They didn't know how, what an asset he was. And so like that side of SF, and I know we do a little bit of that too, but that side of SS, uh, SF is romantic to me because I think that's the right way. Uh, vice vice, kind of how we do it, but but interesting. And so you did the invasion, uh, what year? 2003. So, 03, you go in, and then you go back in 04 or 05-ish? 5, 6, something like that. I can't quite remember. Gotcha. My my upbringing in the Marine Corps was, was not normal. So, you know, you talk about... <laughs> the amount pre- of times you hear that. <laughs> well, you talk about pre-9-11. So, my first point went on, uh, I was in Seychelles on Liberty, and uh, the coal got bombed. So, uh-huh. the next thing we know is Shore Patrol is going out dragging people back to the boat. Mm-hmm. And then we spend the next several weeks in the Gulf of Aden assisting uh, the coals rescue and recovery until it got drug out you know, of harbor and back out to safe sea. Uh, turn around, I don't know, however long it was, 2002. And we uh, were on the coast of, we're on the island off the coast of Kuwait and we're doing urban warfare training, but we took a break in the middle of the day heat and humidity sort of forced us to mm. and we get attacked by a couple of terrorists and lose a marine and another one wounded oh my goodness now and wait where was this the flock island 2000 in the gulf of october aden? 8th you said in the gulf of aden it's, it's off the coast of kuwait oh off the coast it's of like kuwait I'm 10 sorry. clicks or 10 miles i can't okay. remember which and you're just doing training and they knew you were there and tried yeah. to hit you yeah well it's an inhabited island uh i guess before the gulf war it was a pretty popular sort of vacation destination um, so it still had some local inhabitants on it. And 
we we were there. That was the second day we were there. Now one of our sister companies, they had been there for eight the previous eight days doing it. Just happened to be us in that day, but it was October eighth, two thousand and two. And so wow. we get back from that deployment. We're supposed to. Everybody was gearing up for Iraq. The invasion was coming. Uh, First Marines was going. We were supposed to be the battalion that stayed back. Well, three weeks later, we're on a different set of ships going back over there. You're the battalion that's not staying back. <laughs> yeah, the battalion that's not staying back. One, one of, well, let's, one of let's three. go back. Where were you on 9-11? Uh, we were post-deployment. You know, infantry battalion comes back, and some will go to school. Some will go work, you know, different places on base and whatnot. We were in that period of time. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't have a platoon sergeant platoon commander at the time. I was a young corporal, so we had, like, me and a couple of Lance Corporals had about 15 other PFCs and Lance Corporals and Privates. Yeah. And we were just doing company, you know, field training exercises. So that morning, 9-11, we were getting ready to load, I don't remember, I guess it was five tons at the time, getting ready to load five tons to go out to the field for a week. Mm-hmm. And then uh, as we were in formation, company commander comes out and says, I need to platoon commanders and platoon sergeants in my office, send the Marines back to the barracks, tell them to turn on the news. Yeah. So... We're going to war. Yeah, still went to the field that day. <laughs> it's probably the best <laughs> then, thing you could have went to the I field. Then I hiked my Marines back to the company CP that night that were from New York and around the Pentagon area so they could call their families. Yeah, make sure things – did anybody uh, – was anybody – I had some that had up there, but none, none that had any family or close friends involved. Thank God. I was just – I mean, you think back now, that was a long time ago, but some, some days, you know, you're talking to me like this and it feels like – like yesterday. Just like it was yesterday. I mean, I watched a falling man live from my high school classroom on a TV, and that shit changed me. Yeah, it, it was like, yep, that kind of like figured out the rest of my life instantly. It's weird. Weird call to service. There's a lot of our, a lot of my. You're the generation before me, but a lot of our generation came for that reason. Yeah. You know what I mean? So oh, it's, I, I, it's more common than not that that's the answer for the catalyst question. You know, I serve with some just incredible incredible men and women over my 20 years and times but you know you know i came in before 9 11 for different reasons but then i know a lot of people that came in after 9 11 because of 9 11 and then they continued to stay and they continue mm-hmm. to stay now you know i admire admire mm-hmm. that i just mm-hmm. i was already there <laughs> you so, know it's a micro so by the time causes. i could actually get out without you know getting court martial or something i'd already had three deployments two of them in <laughs> combat so you know for me it was just natural to stay yeah and some people kept coming you yeah. know, when I joined, there wasn't no war. There wasn't no threat of war. And on my first deployment, the, the salty Lance Corporals and Corporals said, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. We're going to go train in the desert. We're going to go in Libo in this country. We're going to go train in the desert. That What was the normal cycle, you know, prior to 9-11. Yeah. And then the coal gets bombed. And so I determined then that no deployment was ever going to be normal. Yeah. And to my true astonishment, to it was always true. <laughs> true to form. True. Uh, That's a fact, man, because you – you train up thinking the worst a lot of times, and then it's a lot of times a dry hole, at least in my career it was. I would train up, train up, train up, deploy, let down. Train up, train up, train up, deploy, let down. Oh, and, like, then, and then there's some that aren't let downs, and then you I went to, you think differently about them. I came out of I-9, and I went to 2-6. And 2-6, when I got my orders, they were supposed to be going to Afghanistan. Something changed, and when I got there, they were UDP into Oki, mm-hmm. which was not my dream. Yeah. You know? <laughs> But anyway, I took over his company, Gunny, and uh, a lot of them were coming off of uh, post-deployment, you know, things, either leave or school or stuff like that. And we had a bunch of ranges set up, so some of that stuff was already set up. Before they came back from deployment, I was falling in on it, trying to get ammo set up and mm-hmm, logistics mm-hmm. and stuff. And uh, that was like June or July of 2012 when I, or 11, 12, when I got to 2-6. Well, around Thanksgiving of that same year, the battalion XO comes down and asks if I'm interested in going on an individual deployment to, to West Africa. And I thought about it. I was like, okay. Or something weird that I've never heard of. Don't know what it's about. <laughs> that one. To West Africa. <laughs> yes, I'm going to West Africa. But for me, you know, my family was involved in that decision. I had a six-month-old kid at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, my youngest, Emma, was born. And I could go now. You know, that Oki deployment was another year away. I could go now, be, be around for most of the holidays and those important milestones mm-hmm. and and m- miss six months of her first year, but get everything else. Yep. And so I only had, I had like four days to give my answer. And then I had to be in Virginia Beach in January of that year. So it was another quick turnaround. Sure. And that deployment was far 
from normal. Like, yeah, let's let's get into that. I, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, you know, <laughs> what, like what, were very, your, what was your billet going to be? What were you falling in on? Oh, I don't. Do I? Did I have a billet? <laughs> so, uh, and I don't know. <laughs> I, I forget all the the t- the dirt. The lead up in Liberia, but it was Liberia, and uh, Liberia had, had worn torn multiple coups, military coups. Yep. And uh, at some point in time, uh, entities got together and disbanded their military. So they just disbanded all of them. A lot of them were convicted of war crimes or pending war crimes. And then a couple of years goes by, and some entities decided they wanted to help Liberia stand up a basically a defense mil- military. And uh, so Donacor was hired, and they yep. did some vetting and some training of approximately 2,000 soldiers. And, you know, there's a significant amount of vetting because they couldn't come from families that had had uh, ties to war crimes and stuff. Mm-hmm. I think they kept eight of the old old soldiers around during that time to help build up the Army. Uh, Donacor's contract in State Department gets DOD to step in. So DOT, or DOD was sending Air Force. They were sending Guardsmen over there, Navy over there, Coast Guardmen over there making up just IA teams and they all had different yeah different you know reasons for being there and they had had some people stationed at a camp american wise and liberian wise some people stationed at the camp in monrovia somewhere out by the airport and i was out by what i would tell you was their soi and boot camp mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh so me and a, another guy was out there training them to go up we ended up training a platoon of them to go to mali to join the un that was in the battle in mali at the time Wow. But when I went, it was called Operation Onward Liberty. Now, for a grunt, that sounds good, right? Liberty. <laughs> it was not. Not good. <laughs> not good. <laughs> I mean, it was cool because, uh, you know, we answered to a, a colonel and a lieutenant colonel that was made up of that sort of joint DOT team, spent some time at the embassy, interacted with them, learned a lot about, you know, that type of atmosphere and what goes on there, met some really cool individuals and that did some really cool things. So it was an awesome deployment. You know, if you ask me out of all my deployments and my time away from home, the invasion of Iraq would probably be the first one as far as where I'd rank it. And then going to Liberia and doing that was another one. It was just sort of a step back from normal Marine infantry things. And it was, you know, I saw it as one of my last deployments, most likely. My last, like, I would say cool deployments. Uh And so it was just a good opportunity to do that. That's cool. That is cool because you don't, not everybody, especially in our generation or two, didn't get to see like the feel good side of things yeah. or do like a, a, a true liberation or, or, or partake in that. Um, and it is one of my first one with Fast Company. We went over to help the non combatant evacuation out of Lebanon, out of Beirut yeah. in 06, 06, 07 time. Well, it's frame. funny you mention that. When I get that, when I got to SOTG, that's what I ended up teaching. Oh, really? And it was NEOs. Yeah. And we used a lot of those those case studies from previous evacuations to, to teach our classes. Oh, yeah. And that was a feel-good. Like, we got to help people that had instant gratification. We could see the help. Yeah. And so it gives you that, you know, that heart swell of helping. So, um, but that is cool. I wish, I wish that everybody could experience that. Now, that wasn't your last deployment, though, was it? Yeah, Liberia. Oh, that was, was your last deployment. Yeah. So, li- Liberia's last deployment. Then you get out. And let's get into how you come to being called to the ministry. I really don't know. I mean, it, it, it's a God thing. There's, I'm, I'm grateful for it, but there's no explanation. I, I hate public speaking, which I was an instructor in the Marine Corps at various positions, <laughs> taught classes to, to privates, taught classes to lieutenant colonels and colonels as they're getting ready to go on their muse when I was at SOTG. So it wasn't foreign to me. I just don't enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, man, I, it was New Year's weekend. It was 96. I was back home and I was at my mother-in-law's house and I was reading uh, reading my Bible and I was reading Romans chapter 12 and what I normally don't do is take notes when I'm reading and I got this, you know, like this desire to take notes. So I tar- started taking notes and I messed around with it for a while and uh, come back and I gave it to my pastor and I said, can you just read what my thoughts are here and just tell me if I'm on the right track. And so he read it and then he wanted to meet with me and he asked me if I was called into ministry and I said no. <laughs> Yeah, you know, don't believe so. Sim- simple <laughs> to me, it was simple. But I spent the next five months, four or five months, grappling with that, and it just it consumed every thought I had. And what type of thoughts were you writing down? Uh, Romans chapter twelve is really about uh, service and sacrifice to God, and using your gifts to to serve Him and serve others. Mm. And you know, I will always tell you that Romans chapter one and two was just, or Romans chapter twelve verses one and two was my call to ministry because it was just about a selfless service to God, and. Uh, 
it talks about that being your true worship of God. And I just, I was still active duty and I, I didn't have a plan when I got out. You know, uh, I didn't have full-time jobs lined up and I didn't have this desire to have a full-time job mm-hmm. lined up. I certainly didn't want to be at a place where I had to report every morning at 8 a.m. and get dismissed when somebody decided that they'd made us wait around long enough. Mm-hmm. You, you laugh because you know what I'm talking I about. I know. You laugh but, because it's true. Yeah, right. it's absolutely true. Uh, you know, why do things now when you could wait till 1500 and then get told 1700 and then come back tomorrow morning at 8 to do them? Yeah. Uh, but you I know, knew about it a week ago. Yeah, you certainly did. You, you know those rosters, there's 14. You know, one time we built a <laughs> roster to keep track of our roster. That's ridiculous. I believe it. And uh, that didn't make the first one happy. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, I finally relented because I couldn't get no rest. I, mean, I, yeah. don't, I don't sleep well anyway. Yeah. Uh, I certainly didn't sleep good those months. And then I finally asked my pastor, it was like, you know, if I was called to ministry – tell me what this would look like and i spent a lot of time talking to my wife and she goes is this something that you're really wanting to do and i was like i can't think of anything else i mean that's all i'm thinking about it was distracting and everything i would try to do Mm -hmm. and uh i'd already been serving in the church i was already serving with the youth ministry program and serving as a deacon at the time um you'd say it was i guess a natural progression but to me it wasn't it was absolutely Something unnatural, you, something you fought with, yeah. Yeah, I, I struggled with it, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, but f- I guess sort of for me, I, I guess I needed to struggle with it. I needed to be sure of it. Life is struggle. Oh well, yeah, yeah. That's Every, the point. All three of us sitting here has had our own battles and struggles, and I imagine we still do, and we don't want to talk about them sometimes. But mm. you know, it's just I know if I didn't do it, then I wasn't going to have any you any sort of be rest whole. or peace. Yeah, something yeah. that's making you whole, and you don't have that pit now, huh? No, I'm pretty content with my life. Mm-hmm. I wake up every day in a lot of pain. But I still wake up. <laughs> I think that goes with the territory. Oh yeah, <laughs> you're, you're not, not going to ruck and grunt for 20 years and not hurt. I just it's a fact. <laughs> I don't know. I would, I didn't know what else to do, so I uh, talked to him about it, and we spent some time thinking about it. And for a Baptist church, there's a couple different ways you can do ordination, but really the church itself they can vote on on someone and ordain them, and uh, they're considered ordained within the Southern Baptist community. Uh, we decided to go a slightly different route and ask the Association of Churches, the New River Baptist Association. Uh, so they convened a, a sort of a committee, asked me a bunch of questions, and interrogated me for uh, for an hour, and I honestly felt like an interrogation. And I've been in a lot of uh, hairy predicaments in my life, and I was more nervous for that It one was uncomfortable. <laughs> no, uncomfortable doesn't begin to describe it, brother. <clears throat> but we... <coughs> We left and uh, they agreed that I should be ordained. So it goes in front of our church and then they agree. So I was ordained. And then a few months later, they offered me part-time position there as associate pastor. Um, I enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy telling people about Jesus Christ. Uh, I enjoy seeing people come to know Jesus Christ and actually mm. know the peace that I have in my life now, mm. um, which is something I didn't have years and years ago. And it's not because I... I hadn't accepted him and been saved, so to speak, but my relationship with him was not what it should have been. So, mm. uh, you know, when I joined the Marine Corps, you know, my identity was in the Marine Corps. And uh, when I was a sergeant, when we were going on deployments and we were in combat and war, that was my identity. I was not the best of father, certainly not the best of husband. And uh, I come come through that period and blessed with a wife that was very patient and uh, stayed with me. Mm. But then I, I realized my identity was in Christ, and I quit worrying so much. Uh, I sh- began to see what my priorities should be in my life. Now, I still enjoyed being a Marine, but uh helped me be a better husband and a better father, and for that I'll be forever grateful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the military life isn't always um, conducive to faith base if you can't up keep your faith on a personal individual level in my opinion well i went i went through struggle with that you know how how can i live out this faith and my calling in the ministry and still be on active duty because i still had at least two years at that point in time uh and i decided i was just going to live it out yeah. and yeah. if there was consequences or whatever so be it yeah well there's it's not it's not like overt consequences it's like sometimes you're in the field on sunday yeah or 
or, or you know, whatever, or you're deployed for several Sundays straight, yeah. you know, so that, so that's how you got to have that individual uh, uh, prayer, individual devotion, oh, in my opinion. Uh, for it to salvation work. And, and Jesus Christ is about that individual relationship with Him. Yep. So, you, if you want that individual relationship with Him, it's just like, I mean, you two obviously have a very, very tight bond and relationship with each other, but I know you both have to work at it. Okay. And I, yeah. I, I imagine there's probably times you don't always agree on something, but you, you have to work towards, you know, mm-hmm. that relationship. And then when there is rough patches in it, you're responsible for helping patch that up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's an individual, personal relationship, and you have to work at that. Mm-hmm. And my problem was for years, I wasn't working at it. Mm-hmm. No, and I think that, that that was my problem as well. I know that that it's cliche to hear, you know, a statement like there are no atheists in a, in a foxhole, but... And, and maybe there's truth to that, maybe not. But I know that on deployment, on my last, I'm in Marja, I know that I prayed every single day, every single day. Uh, you know, those life altering experiences have a way of making you think about life. Yeah. You, you know what's interesting is like some of them weren't like very nice prayers. <laughs> Sometimes I was yelling at God. Oh, I doubt you're the first person to yell at him, brother. Sometimes I was, you, you know how that goes, though. It's like, um, and then other times I was praising him and like, oh, thank you so much. I don't know what you did, but, you know, it's that kind of stuff. So then I kind of struggled a little bit with my faith in Marja, too. It was a very weird thing. It was like I prayed every day, but I was angry most of the time because of what was happening, like, to my friends. So that put, like, a, almost a wedge and then, you know, I think a lot of warriors, and I, I, I grew up in the Nazarene church. I still go to church today, usually over at Kingdom Culture when I go um, there in Richlands. But it is something that you must always continue to work for. And one of the things, you know, from the Bible is like, the more you seek me out, the more that I will reveal myself to you. And if you're not constantly seeking them out through the good times and especially through the bad, you're not going to, sometimes you're not going to find it. I think sometimes it's necessary to to struggle in your faith so you can actually work it out. You know, when, Mm. uh, one of my daughters, she, when she accepted Jesus Christ, uh, she, she'd been in church and, and what I would consider a very healthy, healthy Jesus focused church that just loves individuals. Um, but when she decided to accept Christ and, and, you know, one of my questions was, is you're not doing this because of peers or you're not doing this because of some pressure. You're not doing this because I'm a pastor there or you're, I want you to truly know Jesus. Mm-hmm. But for me, I needed to, I needed to struggle and work it out. Mm-hmm. And I, I needed to think I was in control for a while. Mm-hmm. And then I come to find out I wasn't. And then be humble. I was sort of, yeah, it was humbling, but it was heartbreaking. You know, mm-hmm. oh, I'm not in charge. Mm-hmm. You know, I really have no, no say over anything I do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's necessary to struggle sometimes because so you can personally own that faith mm-hmm. and it not be this, not just being my upbringing or my tradition. You know, there's mm-hmm. a lot of tradition in Christianity that is not biblically correct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you need to struggle and it be your own. Mm-hmm. Totally agree. Now, does your religion play into, I assume, your decision to uh, make this campaign to run for a school board in the county? Yeah, it does. I'm doing it out of obedience to God. I, I feel like I did in, uh, when I was explaining how I was called into ministry. Uh, I felt like it was, it was something that he was directing me to do, and the only difference was is I didn't argue with him for five months about it. You just decided, okay. Well, I, you know, I spent some time looking into it, uh, talking to some close people of mine that I knew would tell me the truth and be honest with me. Of course, mm-hmm. my family was a part of the decision. But, you know, I work for a small family-owned business. I run heavy equipment. So me and my boss would sit in a in the shop in the morning before we actually start the work day and we talk a lot about politics current events uh cultural society the way things are going and sometimes just, talks. yeah sometimes just about absolutely nothing but there's a common theme in it is that we kept we kept voicing our opinions and our frustration about the way america is and the direction it's going or at least that we perceive it going and we'd always end up with something well, i wish somebody would do something about this hmm. or why couldn't somebody just do something why why don't conservatives stop this or why don't this this side wake up or whatever and uh i don't know he he said something one day that said maybe you should just run for a position in the county and uh thought about it for a few days and you know at the time i had two kids in school got one in fifth grade now and um that was a time where everything was going on uh in a lot of school districts across the country 
uh, mm-hmm. Virginia being one. There's several others. And Yunkin uh, launched his campaign. Yeah, it right? was it was a bit before that. So I'm about, I don't know, sometime around a year ago this week is probably when I, I quietly, silently decided to run. Mm-hmm. I think it was a little bit later in November before I actually announced and, and began uh, a campaign that I didn't know what I was doing. I say that because there's really no way to figure it out except for figuring it out. Yep. And, uh, Same way to start a podcast, I'm going to tell you. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, that's one. Of, I guess that's one of the fabulous traits about Marine infantrymen is, is that push. You're, you're given a <laughs> tremendous amount of task and, and responsibility, and it's sort of you got all this training in the world behind you, but when it's actually in front of you, you still feel like I'm going to have to figure this out as I go. We're going to have to do this, boys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How would it be the change too? That, that's that's something that, well, I, that I say often is yeah. that there's not enough of us doing and being the change that we want to see. So, so twofold. So for for Christians, for far too long we've sat silently and not voiced, not used our voice. Mm-hmm. You know, churches tend to want to stay out of politics for sometimes incorrect assumptions. But they don't voice their opinions on cultural issues that scripture clearly tells them to have an opinion on, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, there's many of them and it's, it's not enough time to get into it, but also conservatives have set aside some of our biggest issues and fought other battles. Mm-hmm. So I get strong national fence. I get being physically conservative. I get those things that conservatives have stood for for generations. But what we did was we let education system, just sit to the side and Democrats took it over and denigrated it <clears throat> and Democrats have went wildly left to what Democrats used to be. You I know, hear that a lot. I hear that sometimes from my Democrat friends, like it's just, it's they've ran away from their own party almost. It's, it's unrecognizable and it's gotten to the point where, and I, and there's people on, on the conservative side that you can't have a logical conversation. It's with. on both sides. It's both sides both play sides. the same game. But it seems like Democrats' progressive socialist policies have gotten so far unrecognizable from anything America has ever, ever stood for and what it was designed for, what it was built for, that you can't even recognize it anymore. And you've got old school Democrats, you know, that were diehard Democrats, but it was back when Democrats represented something similar to to what America was designed to be. More towards the middle view, yeah. Yeah, we had minor differences, you know, but now it's just wildly different. And, and I think, you know, we talked a little offline about it, but, you know, I don't want the whole show to, 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 to come off as, as political, but at the same time, there is a conversation to be had. And is it a cultural shift that we're experiencing? And if it is, um, what's the answer? Well, I there's obviously a culture shift. I mean, when you look around and... And I've spent a lot of time in other places other than where I grew up, which I would describe as rural, sort of laid-back country lifestyle. Mm. And uh, I've spent a lot of places other than that. So I've experienced the different cultures, both in America and and overseas. And uh, America has definitely went on a drastic, I want to say sudden, but I don't think it's sudden. I think we just sort of realized it was happening. Mm. But it's definitely been a culture shift, you know. I've seen this stuff happening in, in Loudoun County, Virginia. That was the specific one. And I'm like, you know, I, I don't think those things are happening here in Onslow County, uh, at least not in mass. I'm, I'm sure there's the Pockets. The, yeah, I'm sure there, there's an individual here. You know, you can't know what happens inside every classroom every minute of the day. Um, by and large, I think Onslow County has a good school system and has done good things. There's always the exceptions to the rules. Uh, you know, what I was always told in a Infantry unit, there's always the 10 percent, and we're talking about the bottom 10 percent, the ones that were always taking up your time mm-hmm. instead of actually being able to focus on the task at hand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, I saw those things, and I'm like, I don't want them here. And I can say that all I want, but if I'm not willing to stand up and and stand on that wall, you know, what's the purpose of talking? But you know, yeah. we've seen this culture shift. But Christians are guilty of it, but so are conservatives. We I don't know. I don't know if we got afraid. I don't know if we lost our courage. I don't know if we lost our desire to care. But COVID sort of helped open some of that stuff up. Mm-hmm. And I just thought it was – when I retired, I was I really wanted to be done. Service. <laughs> and I think I told you this. I wanted to live in the middle of nowhere, serve in my local church, and be no one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? And uh, I just think what it was meant to be. Time to suffer some more. 
I wouldn't say it was suffering. You know. No, I mean I, by I people was, by people waging by the by the po- politics is ugly. No matter how you look at it, uh, and and when people are gonna, I read some of the stuff on your viral post. Uh, some of the comments that perfect strangers would wage against you just because your opinions are different than them. I'm not even sure if they're people, though. And, and that's yeah, true. You can't with, even with tell bot, anymore. With bot farms and things of that nature, it's yeah. true. But it, it's a disgusting. It's disgusting to me. So, so that's the sacrifice or the suffering that I'm talking about. And 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 you can only suffer as much as you want to suffer well, with that. You know, but. scripture talks about you know if you if you're going to serve Christ, if you're going to do those things, and it's the same way with any group of people. If you're going to serve, there's going to be some sacrifice to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and life's a struggle. It's, you know, that's sometimes right. sometimes we make it more of a struggle than it has to be. But you know, there's people commenting online. They're they're not from here, for one, yeah. and uh. I find it interesting that they make uh, complete and total judgment against me from a minute and 20-something seconds on a post that I didn't plan. Mm-hmm. But uh, That's kind of the motivation for me calling you. It's like I seen Joe Rogan do it last election cycle when Tulsi Gabbard, who in my opinion was solid on the Democratic side. Well, you know she just denounced the Democrats this morning, right? I did not know that. Yeah, but, she, she but came I out with a, But I... But, but it does not surprise me. She came out with a 30-minute YouTube <clears throat> video laying waste to Democrat mentality and policies. But, but, like, yeah, so what I liked about it, I think he did it with, maybe he did it with Bernie Sanders, too. But, but typically what you see with politicians on the right and the left is a 30- or 20-second soundbite. Soundbite, soundbite, sound. You can't figure anything out about who they are in that. you got to look at voting records, and you got to sit down. Oh, Most yeah. of them won't, though. My, my typical moment of talking at those events you know all these events and people ask you to talk most of the time there are 20 or 30 seconds Mm -hmm. because i believe if you really want to get to know me there's ways to do it and if you're making a judgment off of me in 20 or 30 seconds it's probably not well informed because i don't do the best of representing myself in 20 or 30 seconds i would rather have one-on-one conversations or or small group conversations that's the whole point of this i figure i'll give you a two to four hour slot and you say what you want to say and then let people know what's important, where it's at, why you did it, what your past is. If they can relate to you, cool. If they can't, cool. But we put it out there. We don't give them 20 seconds. We give them, you know, 120 minutes. Yeah, and, and my, my objective is, is not necessarily to go out and please everybody I meet. I, That's not I, I don't worry be. about those, those comments on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And I say I don't worry about pleasing people because – if you're doing the right thing, that's not going to please everyone. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to spend the rest of my life trying to make every single person I encounter happy. Mm-hmm. You know, I would tell my congregation the same thing. I'd rather speak to you about the truth that's contained in Scripture and show you who I am and, and the way I talk to you and the way I interact with you and you actually getting to know me, then I'm going to worry about whether or not you like me or not. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, my job ain't to make you to like me. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. You should want them to like your policies yeah. regardless of if they affect them positively or negatively. Yeah. They should be the right policies. Yeah. And that's why I said in that video that you're speaking about, you know, my, my agenda, so to speak. And I, I have platforms and, and policy things that I want to enact and, and those things. But my, if you have to boil down to my agenda, you can boil it down that I want to honor God and I want to do what, what's right by Onslow County. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I try to make things simple. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you want more in-depth things and, you know, none of those people you usually look at that I ignored, you know, yeah, yeah. and I was willing to engage with every one of them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I even told one guy, I was like, I don't get the sense that you're willing, that you want to listen or have a conversation. You really just want the last word. Mm-hmm. So go ahead. I'll give it to you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But and, and sometimes that's necessary. Okay. Yeah. I mean. We've experienced a little bit of that no. uh, with the show. <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, but the, the, but not the much. more you speak, the longer you hang around, the more you experience it. Yeah, I'm just kind of in the same boat, Bradley. I'm in this boat of I have nothing to prove to anybody, and I'm doing something I love that is bringing goodness to other people, and I want to I want to share that with other people. Yeah. And if you want to attack me for that, I'll die on that hill. No, that's, I, that's the I hill. I'll, some, that's the hill I'll plant my flag on. I watch some of y'all's episodes, and I appreciate what you're doing for veterans and, and the information you're putting out and. You know, you're talking about that culture shift. We've gotten this thing where, you know, if you say something I don't like that offends me, I'm now going to do my best to ruin your life. Mm-hmm. Not only your life, I'm going to do it to everybody that's around you. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, it's insane, you know. It's this woke cultural mentality of where 
everything you say is scrutinized by everyone and if you don't say it exactly perfect and exact timing and circumstances that they want they're going to go after you mm-hmm. and, i mean that's a and fact some some people have gotten so afraid that they don't speak out mm-hmm. you know and you know we're probably losing a lot of good people that would that would want to serve and do well for this country because we're treating everyone like crap now mm-hmm. yeah the only thing necessary for evil to succeed is that good men look on and do nothing yeah Interesting. That keeps coming up in my brain over and over and over. Oh, lately. It's, it's kind of proven throughout history. If you if you look at all the the major major things that's happened in this country, they've either happened because people have stayed silent, or they happened because people did something for the benefit of this country. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Culture is definitely wildly different when, than when I grew up. Agreed. Agreed, and I and I, I don't want to say everything's all bad. There's been good things that I've seen, cultural shifts, but in the line of of uh, of the schools, it's very important to me that we um, re- remain, in my opinion, conservative on the side of safety and protection of the students. That's my number one uh, goal, and that includes their mental health which includes some of these things in Virginia and other states that could affect their mental health uh, on a level in which the parents of those states don't seem to be comfortable with. You know, at the, the end of the day, we, we should be uh, responsible enough, mature enough to, to want to see every child that goes to public education receive a sound education. And at the end of that education, they are able to be productive members of society and contribute to this great nation. Mm-hmm. We're not responsible, and nor should we, tell them everything that they should believe and think. You know, we should teach them how to think, not necessarily what to think. Mm. And we've gotten so far away from that. You know, I, the basics of, of reading, math, you know, those type of things. But we do a lot of other good things with, with arts, too. You know, actual art, mm-hmm. music, and things like that. Those things are all important to produce that that well-rounded, educated uh, man or woman that can go out in society and contribute to this country. Instead, we're spending a lot of time arguing about cultural things and social things that those children have no understanding of, and nor should we ever expect them to at that point. Mm-hmm. And to be honest with you, some things are better left to parents. I, I don't I could, know where I we couldn't s- agree with you. More I don't know that. where we got to the point where government should decide everything for everyone. That's definitely not what we're founded on. <laughs> it's actually what we revolted against. <laughs> Maybe where American exceptionalism began. Well, now we have a problem saying that, don't we? I don't. Oh, I'm glad you don't. I appreciate that. But as a nation, it seems like we do. Yeah, I don't. Matter of fact, um, I think about American exceptionalism a lot. Where it came from, how it was fostered, how it was continued, why it's important. Well, we don't want to say it, but it seems like every time the world needs help. They're going to call us. That's a fact. That's a fact. Well, I'm going to give you the last few minutes here um, to talk to the uh, would-be future constituents of Onslow County and um, give them your parting words. Uh, whatever, you, whatever you got for them, I want you to speak straight to the camera. No, I, I think we've probably covered about everything. I, I would say this, you know, Public education, the system, and the people uh, involved in it have sort of, right or wrong, been looked down upon recently. And a lot of stuff in Loudoun County, Virginia, other school districts uh, in the past and some still going, just because those things have happened doesn't mean that they are happening here. It doesn't mean that every school district or every school is bad. Uh, We put a lot of conservatives sometimes tend to put a lot of blame on the school system and the and the teachers but there's a tremendous amount of good teachers in there trying to mm. do the right thing every single day and uh yeah you got children so you understand that there's a struggle sometimes where those teachers are dealing with that struggle 20 different struggles every single day mm-hmm. and uh so I, i'm not going to be the person that that would even come close to bad mouthing them um I, I think our biggest issue affecting our schools is that we have a reputation and a trust to rebuild with the community. Uh, I tell people all the time when I grew up, 
my school was considered, I, I think, uh, looking back, considered like a community resource, and the community actually bonded together to make mm. it a productive resource. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sort of gotten to where the point where many of the parents don't want to be involved in that. You know, unless there's a problem, they don't want to be mm -hmm. involved. Um, and then if there's a problem, they don't know how to be involved because they haven't been involved. And so we sort of alienated uh, the public and the schools. And some of it's reasonable understanding, considering what's happened. But I think we need to sort of rebuild that trust and mm -hmm. work together to be there for the kids and the students. Mm -hmm. But at the well, same time, you know, if you're on the school board, you're responsible to the community. That means you're responsible to the kids, you're responsible to the parents, you're responsible to the teachers, and they're random taxpayer. So all of us need to work together, and we sort of need to rebuild that ability to do that. Mm -hmm. And what are a couple of solutions there for rebuilding that we have in mind? Uh, I sort of thought I don't, I don't know how to. I'm still trying to figure out how to implement it. But you know, usually you have sort of town halls mm -hmm. where people could get together and actually talk. Mm -hmm. If we could do that, where we could actually get together and talk without yelling and pointing fingers, mm -hmm. I think that would be pretty good. Like, uh, have we you, had one where we had yelling and pointing fingers recently in the last couple of years? It's not dramatic here. Right. Uh, it's not dramatic. You see things like this try to go on elsewhere in other communities, and they they sort of spiral out of control. So it had to be something that we, you know, we're all willing to control ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I think mm -hmm. here in Onslow County, we can do that. Mm -hmm. But maybe once a quarter or something, we just gather together and we talk and it ain't just formalities. Uh, you know, how do you implement that as a school board member, be it that you get elected? Well, to do anything on a school board, you have to get other people, at right. least three other people to agree with you. Mm -hmm. So we all have to work together on that school board, even if we disagree on some things. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, sometimes you have to sort of set things aside to do what's best for the community. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think that having a transparent, open discussion at a town hall yeah. style setting would bode well for repairing reputation. Yeah, and I agree. And I, I thought about doing something once a quarter in different areas. You know, maybe we're on the eastern side of the county one one quarter and next time we go to the other. Um, I have to spend a lot more time trying to figure out how to implement that and what it would look like. But. I don't know. Sometimes it seems like when you have these formalities of school board meetings, uh, it seems like it's a us versus them mentality. And I don't think we intentionally are trying to create that. I just mm -hmm. think sometimes it's perceived that, you know, fancy people in suits sitting behind a desk. Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe we'd benefit from just some engagement with a community where, you know, we're listening and talking to each other. There ain't formalities and ain't maybe not a whole lot of action is going to take place that day, but maybe we come to an understanding of what things can, are looking like. Yeah, I agree. And like, I think that this is my personal opinion, but I think that um, COVID took a lot of that away. A lot of the trust. I hey, think that yeah, right. certain things that were implemented um, completely disenfranchised half, at least half of your population. In Onzo County, probably more like 80% of your population. You're right. I mean, and the assumption is, is, you know, all those hot button words that were happening in Loudoun County, Virginia, and those things, and and they're proven to be happening. So it ain't it ain't like there was a we say versus them say type thing. There's some assumption that it might be here in Mass. You know, I didn't run because of what I think's happening. I ran because of what I see happening elsewhere, and I want to be here to prevent it from happening. To to stand up and just protect and defend mm -hmm. our community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know. Humans have this ability to see something and then spiral wildly out of control. And it happens on both sides of politics. I don't care what it's what your political beliefs are or your your spiritual beliefs are. We we have a tendency that when we've made up our mind about something, it must be true. And uh, we need to sort of take a step back and try to understand each other. So sc school personnel understanding parents, parents understanding the school district, and then working together for that kid that's in there. You know, and regardless of that kid's background, regardless of where they're at academically, just to work to make things better for them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. better for the teachers and the school bus drivers and all those people that are, you know, countless people that are behind the scenes every day. Mm -hmm. But we have I to totally build agree. trust. I totally agree. All right, well, you guys got it. That's Bradley Williams. I think we'll leave it there. I, I greatly appreciate you coming out and giving us more than a 20-second soundbite, something that we can kind of get to know you, get to know where you come from, what you do, what you're about. Um, the morals, ethics, uh, ethical beliefs that you have and what you're running on. And, and um, 
and so we can get that out to the to the guys. We're going to get it out there to you guys uh, uh, to to make an informed um, decision on election day. And um, and and again, I've said this before on the podcast. I don't care what side you you swing. I I don't care what side of the agenda you're on. I want you to vote your heart, but I also want you to do your due due diligence. Voting to me is the next most important thing you could do to service your country. Um, and so to 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 pick to pick uh, a, you know to pick a, a a candidate that represents what you truly feel is what 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 I would urge you to do. But definitely don't be the person that lets everybody else decide the fate of your county, your schools, your elections. And so um, with that, I think we'll leave it there, guys. I appreciate you coming out. Choices, not chances. Hope to see you on the next podcast episode. And if you haven't yet, be sure to take my check out my book, Lions of Marja. It's a personal uh, war memoir of myself and Matt and our squad um, fighting the Taliban in 2010 in the stronghold Southern Helmand province. Uh, appreciate it, guys, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Well, that concludes this episode. Thanks for listening to Choices Not Chances podcast. Please share, like, and subscribe wherever you listen or watch our podcast. You can also follow us on social media at Choices Not Chances podcast. Thanks, and have a great day. Louisiana Gun Shop, your firearm headquarters, specializing in concealed carry guns, ammo, and training. You can get your Louisiana permit with us. Also, a large selection of AR-15s, or if you are that build-it-yourself type of guy or gal, we have all the parts to build and customize your own AR-15. Glock, Sig, Taurus, Ruger, we have all the brands, both in the store or at louisianagunshop.com. Not too far. You're marking a building. Hit him. Yeah, that's good. That's a good shot. That's a funny, funny shot. Yeah. Funny.